Hey all, welcome back to Unscripted with Nell Daly. I'm your host, Nell Daly, mom, TV commentator, mental health journalist, and psychotherapist. You're listening to episode 23, which also marks the beginning of season two. Unscripted is so excited to be sponsored by Elm, which is Essential Living Magazine. The Elm publication provides cutting-edge, timely information on natural health, wellness, green living, nutrition, fitness, spirituality, and organic products, all local to the area where the magazine is produced. You can now license an Elm magazine in your own community, which will contain holistic content local to your area. Elm Publishers are a unique group of people who are leading the conversation and changing the way people think about healthcare, wellness, green living, and organic products and foods. For more information, please contact Dr. Diane Hayden at diane at naturalnutmeg.com or you can call them at 860-508-0894. In Connecticut, many of you might know them as the Natural Nutmeg. They are also published in Maine, and they are looking to partner with like-minded individuals all across the United States. This is a show that will hopefully help you live with a little bit more intention, more soul, more self-love, more direction in your life. It's meant to teach people that the message is actually in the symptoms and circumstances of your life. So even though life can be really, really hard, and it is for all of us, you may want to take a moment and consider what the universe is trying to tell you. I used to recommend for years that people take medication to ease their pain. Now I teach how to live a life unscripted. Before I introduce you to my next guest, Derek O'Neill, I want to encourage everyone to follow me and the show on Instagram at Nell Daily and on Facebook. We've got plenty of extra content. We've got giveaways and announcements from our sponsors, all kinds of really cool stuff. And that's also how I get to hear from you guys, which is like so much fun. You can also email us here over at The Daily. We love your feedback. So today I have on Derek O'Neill. He's Irish, and he makes me really happy, as most Irishmen do. Um, If you guys know me at all, I lived in Ireland, and I actually carry an Irish and American passport. So every time I sat with my audio editors to cut this interview, I laughed out loud, and then I felt really, really hopeful about life. He's awesome. There's just no other way to describe Derek. He's a therapist, he's also a humanitarian, and he's a fellow, what I would call intuitive healer, who, like me, has really struggled with his faith and thoughts that he might actually be crazy to believe in all this stuff that we talk about here on Unscripted. So Derek and I kept it really real, and um, I had no idea that during the interview, he was going to tell me the most incredible, moving, and beautiful love story between him and his wife, which, like all great love stories, is also filled with bravery and loss and forgiveness and um, one's ability to surrender to change in our lives and grief. So, without further ado, I hope you guys enjoy this one as much as I did recording it, Derek O'Neill. So, Derek, how do you describe, again, you started telling us a little bit about your history, but I don't even know how to describe what you do and how you do it and who you are. Can you, well, can you I, try to uh, even scratch yes, the I surface of that? <laughs> okay. Uh, jokingly, and it's not a joke, I actually have a, a friend. Uh, his name is John Cropper. He lives in New York. And John Cropper was deemed to be, I think he won an award uh, three, four times maybe, 
world's best marketing strategist. Okay, oh. so here's somebody who knew his, you know, S H one T, if you like, about. And so when I met him, I gave him this challenge, and the challenge was, can you tell me what it is I do? <laughs> <laughs> I find it really difficult. And he said, absolutely. So he, he went on some websites. He went on to other people's websites. He went on to websites of people who don't like me. And, you know, he yeah. pieced it all together. And he came back and he went, well, well, he says, can't put you in a box. <laughs> can't do it. He said, the only thing I'll offer you is you are an outside box mm -hmm. and I went huh and he went you can't put you in a box because you can call on so many sources of wisdom and experience that you know you're more than a psychotherapist you're more than a spiritual teacher you're more than a dad and a granddad and da 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 da, -da, -da. he said so you know he said your best thing is just tell people your experience so that's where I'll start from mm -hmm. I was born in the Coombe Hospital in Dublin. At that time, I was born with jet black hair down to my shoulders. And it was 1964. And at that time, the Beatles were a big uh, band. And the joke was that I, I was the fifth Beatle, you know, because my hair was <laughs> black. black. Was and it the family that said that? Or they said that right in the hospital? The, the, the nurses, the doctors. Couldn't see, believe it. Born, yeah, and I had just been born when my head began to crown, where literally was my mother was jiving or dancing on a dance floor. So dancing, Beatles, kid arrives, black hair, easy story, right? Unbelievable. And it was. And so it turned out that I didn't eat when I was a child. In other words, when they tried to feed me with a bottle or whatever, I'd keep throwing up. They thought I was colic and all these sort of things. But seemingly, and these are stories obviously that my parents and family had to tell me because I wouldn't have known. But in the end, because I had gone something like two or three months without really eating anything, they decided that they would uh, force feed me with drips and stuff like that. And later on, of course, I was to learn I, I could have been what we call a prana baby. That is somebody who has the ability to literally feed on oxygen mm. right? and you know we now have people at the coming forward in the world like the woman who is catholic and all she does is takes the communion every day and doesn't consume any other food and she just drinks water and the, the eucharist so you know it is possible it's not crazy and science is beginning to recognize it so that led to an experience that really blew my family open. <clears throat> and it was at about five, uh, this child came to our home and it had hoop and cough. And I wanted to hold the child, but I was only a kid myself. And, and now is this in Dublin? Are you this was this, your family yeah. still living in Dublin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the family home. And so I kicked up. Uh, enough of a fuss seemingly that they let me hold this child for a couple of minutes put cushions around me so I wouldn't let the child fall or whatever and um, when I gave the child back I had hoop and cough and the child had stopped okay now that's freaky there's no doubt we can call that freaky that's freaky but whatever that did with my mother she became quite protective and angry at me okay so what would begin to happen is i i'd be with my mother or whatever and i'd say things like mr cairns is going to die tomorrow and my mother would slap me because children should be seen as and not heard of course was the great mantra of the irish and, and the children well and also uh, that you're not supposed to uh right in the catholic church you're not supposed to you can talk to angels, but you're not supposed to divine information. That type of stuff, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and so, effectively what happened is Mr. Cairns died. But, you know, I, I didn't get an apology and I didn't get the slap taken away. So, mm. uh, you know, I was this strange kid who, you know, had 
had different interests. Seemingly, I was singing, you know, strange languages when I was five. They thought I was autistic, right? Yeah. Because I was, you know, singing Oh Man I Pad Me Hung or something at five in Ireland in a Catholic home and get off the stage, right? And so, you know, all these stories I have had to be told. And as I began to grow and become more and more aware, I realized I was a bit of an outsider because I would look at somebody and just know there was something wrong with them. And how I would know is I'd either be reading their body language, facial features or whatever, or I'd see these lights on them. Like, you know, like uh, we, we now know it's an aura, but I didn't know any of those words when I was a kid. So but I, my Parents told me I talked in colour a lot. Like I'd go, oh, that woman's very green with envy. Or he's down in the blues. Or he's in the blacks. He's in the dumps or whatever. So so seemingly that was my language, if you, if you like. And because I didn't go to school, I was saved from being educated. And that that's a nice word. Educated. Stuffed with shit to, to put it out. And then that's called a degree. And... Um, where I was educated by life. Um, and, and so I was having all these experiences. And, you know, my mother was getting more and more angry at me having these experiences until she would actually beat me quite regularly. Mm. And so I stopped and I sort of shut down. And interestingly enough, maybe for the listeners to understand if, if something like this is happening around them, when I sort of was hurt enough to, st- to to stop knowing this information, I also stopped talking. And so for about a four or five year period, I stammered extremely badly, extremely. Like, I mean, one sentence, three minutes, bad. Like, is like that, right? And so, uh, at age around 15, uh, I had started martial arts when I was five. And at 15, I was playing football with a group of friends on the, in the estate I lived. And there was this one or two guys who were really tough guys, you know, like the, the, the gang leaders. And one of them was very violent in his approach where everybody knew if you get on the wrong side of this guy, he would he would harm you very badly. He would take off his uh, uh, buckle of his belt. He always wore a good buckle, and he would rip you. He would rip you apart with this belt. And so we were playing football, and I literally went for the ball, and I missed the ball, and I caught him, and he tripped, and he hurt himself, <clears throat> and I just went into a blind panic because I knew this guy was going to absolutely do me, and so I went running. And, and, and I ran into a house nearby and I knocked on the door, but unfortunately there was nobody there. And uh, by the time I realized there was no one there and I turned around, he had come right up behind me and cornered me and I knew I was in big, big trouble. But something incredible happened. It was like, it was like this spirit, this big me stepped forward and I grabbed the guy and I wrestled him to the ground and I end up sitting on his chest and I'm beating his head off the ground and I'm punching him. And there's about six guys off the football team and they're trying to drag me off him and none of them can do it. Like when they would lift me up, I, I would wrap my legs around his waist and he'd lift with me and I'd still be punching him. And as it turned out, uh, literally... When that event was over, they finally got me off. I, I remember turning around and saying to them, you ever hurt anybody again? You ever harm anybody else here again? That's only the start of it. I'm going to do you and realize my stammer had gone. Right? And so the stammer was repressed anger from not, not being allowed to be who I fully was, if you like. Right? And so... um that particular guy and me actually ended up being great friends after. <laughs> <laughs> where uh, at the time I had this craving for uh, uh, 
a Turkish delight chocolate. That was my favourite. Yeah, and the deal was that if anybody was hassled by this guy and they needed, or anybody in the community, they give me a bar of this chocolate and I go and have a word. <laughs> and so I ended up with loads of bars of chocolate, and he liked it as well. So I ended up becoming friends with him and giving chocolate, and he actually turned out to be a really nice guy in the end. So, mm. uh, so, so that led to, you know. Uh, me opening again if you like i then met my absolute rock my my the love of my life the you know the soul projection of who you are in another form and uh, you know the, the story actually it's worth telling the story uh, because it's a very powerful story and it really helps a lot of people sometimes it was how i met linda mm -hmm. so uh, i'm 17 I had joined the army at this stage. Uh, I was starting to come back out of myself, if you like. Now, did you have to join the army, or was that was that by oh, no. choice? You had All by choice, right? Yeah. I, yeah, I wanted to join the army because uh, of the fitness level. Because at the time, I was training in the martial arts, and I had a potential shot at the Olympics. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this would help me improve my stamina while allow me to earn money to help my family as well. How many and siblings were there in the family? There was seven and two parents living in what we would now call a bathroom in people's house. <laughs> in yeah. people's house. It was quite small uh, and, and tight. Mm -hmm. and, and jokingly, I say, oftentimes I'd wake up during the night thinking I was sweating only to find out it was my brother pissing on me. <laughs> he was in one bed, you know? <laughs> and so, uh, so that's all part. And so how, how I met Linda is I mm -hmm. goes to a disco uh, and, you know, typical Irish, all the guys are on one side of the room, all the girls are at the other side of the room. And this is still in Dublin. You're still in living Dublin. in Dublin. In, God. in Dublin. And now people don't understand, like I saw Dublin in 2000, in 1996. Like, Mm -hmm. But I was there as a kid in the '80s as well, and it was it's it was a dark city. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it like, was industrial looking and dark, and I mean, yeah. you have to you have to picture what Dublin outdoor, must have been like at that time. Outdoor toilets, outdoor toilets, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, newspaper used for facilitation sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, it 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 our Ireland now is so unrecognizable yeah. compared to back then. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's incredible, but the simplicity of them, if we could inject some of that back in there, we, we definitely have a great balance here. But yeah, um, yeah so, so, how, so I'm so at the disco. So you're at the disco. Looks across the room and I see is this girl and I just went, wow, wow. What like, was it about her? What was it? Did it, you was see just, it was just everything. It was a feeling, it was mm -hmm. looks, it was everything. And... And so I got the courage to go over and ask her, did she want to dance? And she said, yes. So we ended up dancing for the whole night together. And, and I got to say something now, hopefully not too offensive. To please, me. please go offensive. I love it. I love too much information. You know, Don't I, hold I was, back. I, I was on an erection for most of the dance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so, so the Did she know that? Did you ever tell her that? Oh, oh, oh wait, I tell you. You have to wait to how it goes, right? So effectively what happens is the, the dance is over. We go our separate ways. We ask, will we be there next week? Yes. So she goes, I go. And I decide with me mates, we'll go up and get a bag of chips, uh, chips to eat, you know, because mm. we were hungry. And when we walked into the restaurant, the, the cafe or the chipper, as it's called over here, to get them, she's there. <gasps> right? And I goes, well. So I goes up to her. You know, and I goes, how is it going? Fancy meeting you here again. You know, all very wonderful. And with that, she says to me, Derek, will you do me a favor? Oh, you know, I said, sure. What? He, she says, will you walk this girl home and actually point it at my wife? Oh, right? because I walked Linda home that night. And Linda was not the woman I was dancing with in the disco. Oh my and God. when I went home with Linda, 
the two of us ended up in this bubble of love where we sat on a wall until the sun came back up. And this is at 11 o'clock in the night. So it's now half five, six o'clock in the morning. And we're sitting on the wall outside her home. And we just realized there and then that we had met a, a mirror of each other. And obviously uh, wanted to get married immediately, nearly. And, and so we asked her mother, uh, a couple of months after that, we asked her mother, could I marry her? And she said no. Um, because, you know, I was in the army, so I had short hair and looked a little bit like a gangster, you know, and, and stuff like that. So she said no. But so in love was Linda and I that we, we actually uh, decided that, you know, she, Linda needed her mother's blessing because her father had died when she was younger and, and she really needed it. And we came up with this idea and the idea was that we would go into a hotel and and do the business. And as it turned out, a bit of a marksman in the army, a bit of a marksman. <laughs> <laughs> so you got <laughs> pregnant. So she'd she have to marry you. She certainly did. And nice. and then we put the you know, the magazines in front of the mother with the you know Oh the, she the, would Linda the, was brave. Linda was and, a brave girl. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, she was so, brave to go to that hotel room with you and she was brave to put those magazines in front of her mom. Yeah, so the mother then, being nicely Catholic, as soon as she heard was pregnant, wanted the marriage to go happen <laughs> as fast as possible. So, so yeah, so, um, you know, but the, the, why I love telling that story is it's, it goes to show you the huge difference between lust and love. And, you, you know, as, as somebody who has become a bit of a relationship expert, uh you know, I, I can spot a mile away now marriages that are already failed, but people are staying in them completely unhappy. Um, you know, for the children's sake, it's called and such likes. But, you know, the disaster that happens down the line is dreadful. And so it's such a pity that we we can't communicate better and see if there's something there to re-spark it or solve it or maybe they're just tired because the kids drive them spare and they need more time and there's not enough family backup or whatever whatever so uh so that's why i like telling that story because it's like but what, such a, do you what was it what did you and linda you have to tell us what did you and linda talk about like what was it do you remember what the, what was yeah, said yeah. like or was it just did you see light around her did you see an aura no, did you feel an no, energy no 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 that and that's what was so innocently beautiful about it you know i talked about my my family my upbringing being in the army she spoke about her family whatever turned out we both had the same amount of siblings in in both our families we had seven seven to two ratios and you know and it was just everything about it. And it turned out, <laughs> it turned out she was a real wild child. She was like, you know, when she wanted something, she went for it. She had, at the time, she was the manager of a bakery. Um, and, and at that age, like, that was a great job to have. Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, when, when we finally did get married, we actually lived in a mobile home before we, we got a house. And, you know, the joke to this day is she had to sell her car so we could have a fridge. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's great. It's great to have that sort of uh, experience in a lifetime. Yeah. And so tell us what happened with Linda. How many children, what the trajectory was? Well, uh, we had uh, Gavin and Orla. Mm -hmm. and and uh, we were married for 25 years and Linda had never been sick a day in her life. Mm. Uh, and I mean that, not, not like she, uh, uh, she didn't drink. She'd have the odd glass of Guinness every couple of weeks. Uh, she didn't smoke. She ate well and she was a martial artist, trained well. And I was off um, doing some sessions and, and my phone rang and was my daughter saying, uh, mum's after getting a really bad headache. And I heard myself saying words I never thought I'd ever say, and it was, ring a doctor. And and why I'd say that's unusual is because uh, I haven't, I don't really go to doctors very much myself, and neither did she. So they brought it to a, uh, she rang the doctor, the doctor said, I'm sending an ambulance. An ambulance came, brought it to the hospital. 
she waited a, a couple of hours to be seen by the doctor and by the time she was seen the doctor said she had a migraine gave her some tablets and sent her home so that was fine and then uh, a couple of days later she had a bit of a turn and again i was still away at this stage thinking that it was just a migraine even though there was something i knew there was something more and next thing you know the phone rings again and she's after being taken into the hospital and uh, they they diagnose it's a migraine again and and send her home so at that stage i fly in and as soon as i see her i just went oh god and not to send her into a panic and not to send my daughter who was very attached to her into a panic i i said to all i said would you do me a favor i said would you bring your ma up to the doctor again and just say you're not happy with how she looks and would he actually do examine her again so she said yes and she went up and literally whilst linda was in front of the doctor she had a bad turn uh the doctor suggested that uh or alexa or not alexa sorry orla uh orla yeah orla mm. brings her to to the hospital now there should have been an ambulance call because she had her tour there and then but orla had to actually bring her out literally carry her out uh put her in the car bring her up at that stage i had enough i drove directly to the hospital and as i was going in they were sending her home with why are you wasting air time we told you it's a migraine blah blah so i stopped the doctor and i says to the doctor excuse me i said um have you children and he went huh i said have you children and he went yeah and i said well i'm going to tell you now you're never going to see your children again i said because this is the third time my wife has been here and i'm telling you that's a stroke she's at the hand and she really needs medical intervention. No, no, no such a thing. We did this test. And I said, I don't care what test you did. I'm telling you. So literally just to appease me, they took an X-ray. Now, they should have took an X-ray on the first visit, never mind the second, right? And so they took an X-ray. And when they took the X-ray, the shit hit the fan. Because they realized she was bleeding into her head. You know, a big panic happened. To cut a long story short, she's admitted into the hospital she uh stabilizes somewhat she then has to have one of those spinal taps you know mm -hmm. where you put mm -hmm. up your spine and that distressed her enough uh that she had another turn the blood vessels burst open she bled into her head and three days later she was dead uh, and you know whilst anybody else would have taken the hospital to court because it was an open and shut case that it was complete neglect all the way along and uh, we as a family decided that we would meet with the doctors and ask them how could we help how could we make sure that this never happens again that wow. just one doctor writes something in a chart you can't allow the other doctor to just accept that diagnosis and specifically with something like this and the outcome of that was Two of the doctors were crying because they were expecting us to be screaming and angry at them. They couldn't believe that we were saying, how can we help? Who can we write to? What, what you know, senators, ministers or whatever can we, can we talk to? And then because of that, now in that particular hospital, if somebody goes in with a head, anything around the head or head injuries, they automatically get a second examination after the first one incredible yeah so that's linda's service to the world how how long ago was it that linda passed uh, nine nine years ago tell me how did how did her death change i mean obviously we know in the practical ways that that someone that you're married to or related to dies changes your life but how did it change the deep that work that you were doing in oh. terms of your service and with patients how did it change your career tremendously because you know at that stage i was doing those workshops in in new york um, and those times when i had a thousand two thousand people in the audience okay and you know it, it was very powerful and very together and very energized and uplifting and good tools being applied but i had sort of if you like i had hidden that I was even more sharp 
that I was allowing myself to show, if you know what I mean, mm-hmm. that I could people quicker and stuff like that. And so uh, Linda said so something. So you, what you mean is your intuitive self. You had sort yes. of everything that you do that's in t- your intuitive work, you were still kind of keeping under quiet yes. wraps. We're keeping it under quiet wraps, yeah. And, and Linda said to me, literally two weeks before she died, uh, Linda and I had gone into Dublin city centre now we had moved outside Dublin at this stage. And we went in for the day. And for some reason, I found myself showing Linda all the places that I ever lived. Like, this is the army barracks where I broke my jaw. And this is the house we lived in. And she took a photograph of me outside this house because my head was nearly reaching the roof outside. And it was like, Without realising, it was like a completion. Like, I was shown her places that I'd never shown her or told her stories that I'd never told her, if, if you like. D- you know, they, all of a sudden they were relevant stories, if you know what I mean. And so, effectively, uh, she said something to me, and, and it, was, it wasn't until afterwards it was to realise what she said. And she said, you know, Derek, you need to step out from behind my shadow. And I went, huh? And she went, I've noticed that you're now, uh, you know, pushing me forward and you're hiding behind me. Mm. And she said, you have gifts, Derek. I've witnessed them and you need to, the world sort of needs them and you need to step out. And I knew at that stage that I did do that. I was hiding and I was beginning to back off and whatever. And, And so... If I could say this in, in total ignorance, but love all at the same time, does part of me believes that she nearly decided to, to leave, to, to make me step forward? Mm-hmm. Because when she, when she did die, I, had, I found myself at obviously loose ends and I had more time and stuff and stuff. So I really threw myself into helping people and people who have obviously now I have some you know quite uh, personal even though I had a lot of personal tragedy before that anyway but now it was even more personal uh, and so that gave me a, 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 a compassionate edge that I already thought I had but actually I realized I, I was even deeper now so she had a, a, her, her death had a huge effect on uh, my ability to be there for people even more now than I was then. And then I was there a lot for people. Mm-hmm. I think that when uh, I recently had a uh, coffee with someone who lost their wife quite young, uh, mm-hmm. when they were very young, in their 30s, and it was the love of his life. Mm-hmm. And, and I said, how, I'm looking at him across the table going, how do you survive that? Right. That's as a therapist, I'm still always in awe of people's strength and resilience. Always Mm. like I always sit in awe of it. And he said, I think you love more. I think you love even deeper. And I thought that what a beautiful thing, what a beautiful message there is in that, because so many of us, when we go through pain, I mean, certainly over here, we're taught to just medicate it and hide it and cover it up. And that's a good you know, I'm glad you brought that up. I think you're absolutely correct because it's so easy when you're going through the uh, pain at first, you know, uh, it's so easy to reach for medication. And that's one thing I never did. Never reached. I, I, I held the pain, you know, for months afterwards i'd go to the press and i was still taking down two cups when i was making a cup of tea it was like sort of muscle memory type of stuff but i stuck with it and you you know it brought up this deep 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 compassion and as i say as wonderful as medication is and i i you know there's lots of people need medication you know if 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 people can go through it uh they, they will find when they come out to their end, it's much more authentic and gives them a depth of compassion that is just unmeasurable, actually, at times. So you've had to obviously muster a massive amount of courage in your life to 
do the work that you want to do authentically with your full gifts. And I have to say, I totally believe in the idea that uh, people in our lives that are closest to us pass when they know they're, when not only they're ready to pass, but when sort of the, the alignment happens, sort of the universal alignment happens and they say, okay, I need to step out in order for this person, as you say, to step forward. I felt that in my own life, but can you tell us, uh, when when you how do you explain again like what it is i mean you're very interested in this idea of consciousness and higher consciousness and the higher conscious self how is it that you do what you do with people how do you train them and also do you ever lose faith in it do you ever think like i'm completely utterly fucking mad <laughs> like you know and like you look for signs still and um, i mean yeah. Great questions. Well, um, yeah. Well, the the first thing is when I when I discovered that we had sort of been uh, railroaded, if you like, uh, to believing something that wasn't fully true, and I broke through that. So what I'm talking about is, if you go into any you know wellness place, bookshops, whatever, whatever, you'll always see mind, health, and mind, health, and body, or wellness or mind health and body wellness workshops or whatever whatever and what i discovered was that's how we lost our power because the mind gives you the impression that if you're not educated then you're stupid you're unworthy and you're not worthwhile in the community right and the body was all about image and you you know if you had a few pounds overweight you bet the shit out of yourself uh and and spirit was something that sort of you know uh, you either went into a bottle of under the name of vodka or, or whiskey or you sort of, you know dabbled off over there with the weirdos you know and but what i discovered because of trips to india and tibet and stuff was that's how we were entrapped because we had bought into the backward or upside down program and so I started to teach people that it's spirit, mind, and body. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, you see these light bulbs going off over people's heads. And, and as somebody who sees light bulbs going off over people's heads, you know they're having a aha moment. And they go, what, what do you mean? And you go, well, look, if I change the word spirit and call it nuclear, okay, it's easier for me to explain so we have this nuclear big ball of nuclear energy up above our heads we call it right and that is nuclear energy it then hits our mind when it hits our mind if we haven't dealt with our past griefs hurts harms you know jealousy envy bitternesses and all that sort of stuff then that energy turns into a nuclear bomb in other words, it's destructive, okay? If it, if the same energy hits and, it, you know, you have dealt with that stuff, now it creates medicine, nuclear medicine, which is healing, okay? And so if it's on in the bomb side, it'll show up as an illness in your body. So when I was diagnosed with cancer all those years ago and I was, you know, this poster boy for fitness, I was training to be an Olympic athlete. I had trained all my life and now I'm being told you've your lung cancer and you better get your shit together. And I go, no, wrong guy. What's the story? And meditate the cancer out of my body, which the doctors to this day will still deny. But, you know, I'm still here. <laughs> so, uh, you know, sorry about how old, that. Guy. How old were you when that happened? How old were you? Oh, when- in early 20s and so you know so you were already meditating at that point yeah yeah at that stage because you see my the the uh, trainers in my martial arts came from korea and and japan so they had already captured me and they had already spotted this ability in me anyway so it was a an easy call if you like for me to, to to get into that space Mm-hmm. right and so you know i meditated now of my body so now I, I again i can authentically say to people you know whatever whatever's going on in your world if you understand that 
the, an illness in the body is only a messenger to tell you something is out of alignment with love or out of alignment with you, then you can ask the messenger, what is the messenger, before you kill the messenger, maybe with medication or something else, drink, whatever, self-medicating, uh, you ask the messenger, what is the message? And it'll give it to you. It truly will give it to you. And for me, the message was that I was angry at my mother for beating me up and, and shutting me down and keeping me angry and locked down and feeling stupid and inadequate and all those great things. And so when I dealt with that, guess what? <laughs> it all disappeared and, and I became, uh, again, well. uh, a, a lighter being. So, you know, let's start telling people that it's spirit running the show, spirit, mind and body and not mind body spirit because if you keep it in the mind then you're trying to you know so if science can't prove if science cannot prove that people can go for months without food well then that means that somebody going for months without food is a liar or trying to fool people or whatever but no guys you can't you can't pull those cards you have to understand that there are both sides to a coin and there are amazing things going on and there is amazing proof out there if you want to look for it. But all arrows will point that this spirit, this higher self, this higher understanding, this God energy, if you want to call it, that by any name is the driver. Mm -hmm. It wants to bring you home. It will never send anything to hurt you. And this is important for your listeners potentially to hear, right? Nothing happens in your life to hurt you. Everything that's happening that you're tagging hurt is trying to wake you up to something hidden within yourself. And if you see that, you'll absolutely begin to see where if that shit hadn't hit the fan at that time, you'd still be in a job that you hate. But because that person told about a story and you got sacked, you're now in a place that you love. <laughs> and it's like, you get it now, guys? Get in there. Let it know that only the universe is only trying to wake you up to who you truly are. Mm -hmm. Neil Donald Walsh, who's a writer who wrote the series called Conversations with God. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Uh, I did an interview with him, and he, in one of his children's books, he says, God sends you nothing but angels. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, he's absolutely correct in that because, again, you know, it, it's unfortunate that when we use words like angels and stuff that people do, oh, there's that cult fucking out there doing yeah. the shit. And it's like, hey, guys, do you, do you realize how many uh religions out there even have room for these beings these these messengers these angels you know and it's like hey at what stage do we begin to understand that maybe that angel is inside you and like my story of linda i absolutely believe that the female part of me manifested and her name was linda mm -hmm. at that stage i needed a linda because i was becoming a tough little cookie you know, yeah. full of <laughs> you needed the, the Adi Shakti, you needed the balance yes. of the masculine and the feminine. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, when people say to me about soulmates, I go, there is no outside soulmate. You can take my word on that. Your soulmate's inside. And when you're ready, when you need, when you absolutely have the moment of realization that you are this holistic person who doesn't need anybody to tell you you're good enough or you're not good enough or you're clever enough or whatever once you get that tell those people to piss off because they'll only entrap you with their negativity anyway that's when bingo somebody shows up in your life and it's like hey looking in the mirror and that's what I think a soulmate is. Mm. You know, it, it's really interesting what you say also about it took me a while to come forward. Mm -hmm. Given what I do for a living, I, I'm, you know, on national television quite a bit now. And I thought, oh, my God, I, I was actually told you're going to ruin your career. Yeah. If you come forward and talk about 
seeing light or seeing auras in your office yeah. or hearing stories that you're like, no, 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 that's not a coincidence. Something divine is happening here. Yeah. And at some point, at some point, I just felt like I couldn't help it. Like I mm -hmm. woke up one morning and I kept saying, I don't want to be in service. I don't want it. <laughs> like, I don't want that life. Like, go away. <laughs> Uh, Please, because you meet people like you, you're in service, and you're like, oh, shit, that's, like, all-consuming, right? Yeah. yeah. And, yep. and then it happened to me, and I was like, God. And then yeah. you can't, you know, it just knocks at your soul and your, and, and your being all day long until you heed to it, right? It just sits there. It kills the ego very quickly, which is beautiful, because, mm -hmm. you know, as you say, you know, I'd be very aware that some of my close friends might think I'm a wacko. Yeah. Well, okay, oh. I think I'm a wacko. So I think last time I, I was on television, 5,000 people wrote that I was a wacko on Facebook. <laughs> well, like, you know, so as I say, I neutralize it by going, should I call myself all those names anyway? Uh, <laughs> and, and so that's okay, a wacko. But there is one point that you asked that I think is a very important one, and it's about do I ever... Question. Want give up do i ever want do i lose faith and the answer to that question unfortunately is yes yes like, like uh, i'm i'm i am like i might be crazy and this yeah, is all yeah. a big i've like created something in my mind or yeah mm -hmm. absolutely and and not only that it's when for me it's more when when i see you know i used it used to be my hang-up used to be when i seen good people being injured Mm. you know and then of course karma and all took all that away but for me it's that element now of you know this this god being you know what why 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 does he allow all that suffering and you know and and so i would drop back into that but then i i catch some teaching that some uh you know rinpoche in 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 north india or yogi in south india sat with me and, and and explained to me that you know hey you know man created the problem man must solve the problem mm -hmm. don't be blaming the gods mm -hmm. this is this is man stuff and so go do your service know that not everybody is going to like you know that it's probably one of the loneliest trips you'll ever take and you know, I think that was part and parcel of taking Linda out of the equation somewhat as well, because obviously you become uh, much more lonely. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, if you were having a shitty bad day, at least you could go back to Linda and she could give you some sort of, you know, uh, commiseration or whatever. Where now, now do you feel like I'm, I'm divorced and I'm single and uh, I feel like my loneliness has to be filled with spirit? Yes. Hundred, like hundred. I, I, I mean, I, I sit in, I sat in yoga this morning, and my yeah. yoga practice is dedicated to spirit yes. because they're the ones holding me up at this time. There's nobody uh, there at the end of the day. Being like, hundred uh, percent. And um, people will show like, there's a woman in in Cork who's very Catholic, very religious, and yet yeah, has had these amazing spiritual experiences that she just goes on and denies that she's hilarious, <laughs> funny about, you know. Uh, and I, I never think she ever listens to this. Her name is Nula O'Connell, right? <laughs> and like, you know, Nula is, is the most precious, you know, loving, uh, spiritual being. And she will correct you immediately if you say such a thing. And she'll go, no, Jesus is my man. And Jesus is it. And, and yeah, she's had all these incredible experiences. And to me... That's the def. She is the definition of truth because, you know, her belief. Because uh, as I always say, your belief creates your reality, and her belief is so beautiful in in her religious upbringing that it's brought these spiritual experiences to her, and she too has gone out and helped in in huge charitable ways. And she rings me to tell me, you know. I'm I'm her hero, and I just laugh because I keep going. Yeah, I'm looking in the mirror. Aww. I see you. So you know, it's it's great when when we finally understand that we don't need things. Uh, we don't need things, materialistic things, to make us happy or qualifiers for who we are. And you know, you even get to a stage where you release people out of your life 
having to play roles that they might necessarily feel comfortable with. Mm-hmm. And in doing so, you actually release them to play the role even more authentically. And it's incredible because, y- you know, we, we have this thing where you hear about people who visit their mothers who are not well and every time they leave their mother, they're drained because she's given out about them and whatever, whatever. And, you know, you'd love to release them from that role and just say, look, stop looking at your mother as your mother. Just see her as a human being in distress. Mm. What do you do if you've seen a human being in distress? You know, would, would you help? And, and they go, yes. And I go, would you help at the level you're helping now? And they go, no. And I go, great. Well, then reduce your help to that level. And yeah. you'll be more healthy. And so your mother will begin to see that and she'll begin, and I believe that she'll begin to respond to that in, in a more positive way because uh, sometimes we do hurt those we love the most, mm-hmm. uh, you know, do quite you, close. Do you believe, really quickly, I know that we're getting shorter on time, but do you believe in reincarnation? Do you believe in... I believe uh, this is, you, you know what, again, because that conversation can has so many angles and edges, yeah. here's my interpretation of it. I believe that we're all made of energy. There is nothing else but energy. Mm -hmm. Science has proven that energy is the only substance that cannot be stored or destroyed, right? So stored means it can't stay in the one form or the one shape, okay? Uh, And it can't be destroyed means it goes on forever. So what's to say that we aren't, you know, in this form now, we drop it, the energy goes into the, the bigger grid, and then it's pumped out the other end as something else. It, it it can be that simple. But I think what happened was, you know, and, and, and I did this at one of my workshop caused absolute pandemonium. <laughs> and this really sums up. I all. love creating absolute pandemonium. <laughs> this, this did now I kind of live for that. Yeah, I had this situation begin to happen when I first start doing the workshops where all these people were declaring themselves Mary Magdalene returned right oh god and, yeah and it was like it got to a stage where we ended up with about 11 of them in this group who were all Mary Magdalene and they were all telling me and I was going mm, yeah right okay and so I would tell them no you're not Mary Magdalene you're not Mary Magdalene what you are is Mary Magdalene is a consciousness, and it is the consciousness of being put down, prostituting ourselves, whatever, whatever. So something's going on in your life at the moment that you feel you're prostituting yourself to or whatever. So her, uh, that consciousness is playing on you and you think, oh, no, 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 I'm her, I'm her. So to end it all, and I knew I was going to be in serious trouble after this, this is when up to this, I was the, the golden child. After this, I became bleeding Satan, the devil, right? Yeah. <laughs> because what I did is I got every one of them and I went, at the next workshop, I think you should tell people who you are. I think the world needs to know. Are you ready? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm ready. So at a certain point in the workshop, I, I, we talked about reincarnation. And I went, okay, I believe that people here think they could be Mary Magdalene and I think that the real Mary Magdalene should stand up now and give us our blessing and of course the 11 of them stood up they all went into shock as they looked around and realised huh you couldn't be (laughs) Mary Magdalene and and the shit hit the fan so let me you know the idea of telling you that story and the brilliance of it is that we're capable of tapping into consciousness Mm -hmm. and it comes in many flavors and many streams and at any given moment one might be passing through but that doesn't mean you're you're it it just means it's passing through and feel that energy that presence coming in yes yes Mm -hmm. do you hear it when you hear someone coming in or or for you it's pretty It, it used to i used to hear it i used to see it whatever now all as I can tell you in absolute truth is it's 
everywhere. I'll I'll be talking to somebody and I, I see a glint in their eye or a move of their finger or something, and all of a sudden I'll have this wash of information about them that I shouldn't know. Right. I just shouldn't know. And but I do know and to be honest, I think the martial arts training was extremely helpful. Mm-hmm. You know, because you have to learn body language and stuff. The psychotherapy was helpful. Oh yeah. And add those two to the spirit, and I think I have what I, what is supposed to be getting called holistic therapy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's funny because when I have resistance from people and they say, "Well, do you consider yourself clairvoyant or intuitive?" and for me, I think it's just about being open and spending enough time. I mean, I've done, what, 20,000 hours now of psychotherapy with people over the last decade. You spend enough time in people's souls in that sort of intimate setting, you get really good at looking at energy. Yeah, and patterns. And, and, and patterns and just yeah. and all of it kind of comes into you. I don't get washes necessarily of information, but I definitely know things about people that I probably shouldn't or very quickly can understand that information. So I don't necessarily think it's anything divine. I just think I'm picking up on the energy around them. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And again, what do we call that? Only listening and being still. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you still meditate every day? Um, my life is now my meditation. You're, every, it's like a moving meditation every moment. The of me is to serve humanity as best as I can until I don't have this body to do it anymore and mm-hmm. I can do it in another form. Um, and And... You know, that's what gets me out of the bed in the mornings. And on the mornings, some mornings when I don't want to get out of the bed because the world is being a bit shitty, um, that's when I hear that inner voice that says, yeah, yeah, great, get up. <laughs> you do. You do hear that? Because I have trouble getting out of bed, even though I'm in service. I do. Yeah, of My alarm goes off in the morning and I'm like, oh, I'm yeah, here another day. Good. You've been on. If you've been on the phone to somebody, and and it's often happened because I work in different time zones around the world. Yeah. If you're on the phone to somebody till two o'clock in the morning because they're really badly distressed, and that yeah. you need to be there for them or whatever, and then you know you, you you go in, clean your teeth, whatever it is, and you go to bed, and it's you know you're you're then up at four o'clock in the morning. Yeah, your alarm's going to go off, and your first thought isn't going to be oh wonderful. It's going to be feck sake, but uh, you know. That's part of that's part of the great humanness of us, and you know what? I think a lot of spiritual people need to become much more human as well, because a lot of them put themselves on pedestals they don't belong on. Right, right. So uh, to that note, so one of the things that was remarkable about your workshop, and I just want to kind of plug it out there for you guys to follow Derek on social media. You have a, you're very active, I think, on Twitter. Uh, you do stuff on Facebook as well. Uh, and so you get a lot of messages there and also any upcoming events that you're doing. I know that you do this big retreat in June in Ireland, right? Every single year, which is... The big players. That's for people who absolutely want to change their life for the better. Mm-hmm. No no messing in that workshop, I can tell you. Yeah. <laughs> Plenty of play and fun and laughter, but no messing. <laughs> yeah, that's what I've heard. I've heard. I've heard like you just sit there for a week in awe of the entire thing. And like, buckle in. That's what I've heard. I've heard just buckle in for the experience. But one of the things that surprised me, and I don't know why, mm. in New Jersey was there's a lot of people in a lot of pain. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, it's, you know, and, and, and you talked about you and in connection to this, some people are actually capable of holding other people's pain. Yeah. You don't realize it. And, you know, when that happens and it becomes overwhelming, I think that's where they need to talk to somebody like me at that stage because I can determine and go, listen, that doesn't belong to you. So Mm -hmm. ask for a break or ask for a rest from that because that will break you, you you know. But it won't kill you. It'll just break you. It'll make the the journey more difficult because you'll never be given more than you can handle. That's a guarantee. But, you know, it's, it's like... You know, people say to me these silly things. They go like, uh, Derek, how come you only have, I don't even know how many, a, a, a thousand followers on Twitter? And I go, I really don't know. It's because I'm putting out positive stuff every day. Like, So mm-hmm. what I'll put out would be useful, whilst all the other sh- SH1 t- <laughs> is 
is just cluttering the mind, which people seem to like so that they don't have to deal with yes. the clarity of who they are. So, you know, as I just say, the worst thing people can do is start to follow, you know, Derek O'Neill 101 on Twitter, because every morning you're going to get this message into your phone that says, mm. you know, something like this morning's one was your mind and, and your, your, your mind is like prime real estate. Be careful who you let in there because some might look after it and some might wreck it. And that's like saying, be careful who you're allowing into your life. Thanks, guys, so much for listening to today's episode of Unscripted. Again, please follow my comings and goings on Instagram. You can check us out on Facebook at Unscripted with Nell Daly. LinkedIn, we're on Twitter, any other kind of social media you can think of, we do. Peace out. Till next time, namaste.